this lesson is about Pozzolo et al. study, which was done in 2011, and it focused on understanding the ways in which children respond when they are asked to choose a suspect from a lineup. And a lineup is essentially where you have potential suspects and children are supposed to choose who they think the perpetrator of a crime or the culprit of a crime or the person who committed a crime is. And so Puzulo and her team wanted to study how children make those decisions and why particularly with children you find a high degree of what we call false positives. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about false positives, but let's look at a quick overview of the study before we move on to the background and to the specific psychology that Pazulo and her team are trying to investigate. Now, a quick overview, as you might already know, this study is housed within the cognitive approach. And one of the key things about the cognitive approach is that it's very much focused on the mental processes that occur inside our brains to help us in terms of our thinking, in terms of our remembering, our problem solving, and our decision making. So in the cognitive approach, psychologists view the brain as a computer, and the assumption is that much like a computer, our brains will receive input from the environment and then process that information or that input and then produce a response, which is a behavior, a thought, an attitude, a choice, a decision, and that is then the output of the information that your brain has received. Now, Pazulo had done a lot of previous research on how children in particular make decisions when they are asked to identify the, the criminal or the possible culprit of a crime. And the thing you should also know is that many crimes, particularly violent crimes, which, are, which span theft, vandalism, which is destruction of someone's property, or sexual assault, such as rape or abuse, will unfortunately occur with a child who is an eyewitness. And many times the child eyewitness is quite young, so younger than the age of seven. And the other thing then you need to know is that when such a crime occurs, there's also a very high reliance on eyewitness identification, which is obviously when a witness sort of identifies the perpetrator of a crime. But the problem here is that many times the identification is done mistakenly, it's not correct. And as a result of that, you have what are called wrongful convictions. Essentially, the wrong people are put behind bars or are then serving time because they were identified for a crime that they did not actually commit. And another thing that you also then need to know is that when you have a lineup of potential suspects, but the actual criminal or culprit is not part of those, is not in the lineup, at that point then you will find that more mistakes will occur. And those lineups where the culprit is missing are called target absent. And we'll come across this uh, term a little more as we move forward. So we'll keep on repeating it and you'll become more familiar with it. But when we're talking about what happens when you are confronted, when you as an adult or if a child is confronted with a lineup of possible suspects and has to choose the culprit, what is responsible for those mistakes occurring? Now, you should know it's not easy to simply separate the social from the cognitive because at the end of the day, our brains do interact with the environment and that influences our decision making. It influences the choices that we make. At the same time, it's important for us to understand well, do social factors play a larger role or is it actually just internal mental processes? Is it actually just our cognitive factors that lead us to make certain choices. And Pozzolo and her team wanted to figure this out, particularly whether it's social factors or cognitive factors. And so to figure this out, what they did was they conducted an experiment that included 59 children and 53 adults to compare how children behave as opposed to how adults behave. 
Now, before I really get into it, a quick a quick thing about the key terms that you will sort of keep on coming across as we move through this study. Eyewitness identification, as I have mentioned, is simply determining whether and who the perpetrator is when presented with a lineup of suspects. You should also know that, well, when we're talking about lineups, there is a target present lineup where the actual perpetrator is in the lineup. And there is a target absent lineup where the actual perpetrator is not in the lineup. Lineups also tend to include people who are potential suspects. And the reason they are potential suspects is because they may be seen to match the sort of characteristics, the height, the weight, the skin color of the possible suspect. And the next thing you need to know is that false positives, whenever we come across this term, generally in psychology, we talk about a false negative as when you take a test of some kind and it shows you that you have a particular condition, but in actuality, in reality, you don't have that condition. And false positives, when we're talking about lineups, means that you are identifying a perpetrator who is not actually in the lineup. So you are making a mistake. So you can also remember false positives will also be referred to as an incorrect rejection rate or the higher the false positive, meaning the higher the incidence of identifying a culprit who is not actually there, then also the lower is the correct rejection rate. Now, a rejection rate is basically saying that no, right? Rejection means no. So a decreased correct rejection rate means that you are incorrectly not rejecting the people who are in the lineup who actually have not committed the crime. And if this sounds confusing, don't worry, it'll make more sense as you get more and more familiar with the study itself. This was just a very quick overview. And you already should know, because I mentioned earlier, cognition uh, simply are the mental processes of thinking, remembering, problem solving, and decision making. And lastly, of course, we have memory. In psychology, we will define memory as the product of all the processes in our minds that lead to an event being stored for the longer term. And then that event or that piece of information is later extracted in the process of remembering. So the extraction of information from our stores of memory is called remembering. And I'm sure you maybe have never thought about exactly this before. So it's a nice thing to remember. So now let's really talk about what is the psychology under investigation or the psychology being investigated by Pasulo et al. in this study, which is called the culprit in target absent lineups, understanding young children's false positive responding. Before I move forward, please do remember that culprit here means the person who committed a crime. Target absent means or a target absent lineup refers to a presentation of possible suspects of whom none of which are actually the culprit. So the culprit is not present in a target absent lineup. The word target here refers to culprit. And then false positive, as I mentioned earlier, is when you identify something as being there when it's not actually there. You are positive that something is there, but you are wrong, meaning it is a false positive. That thing, that person is not really there. And so, well, the first thing that Pazula and her colleagues wanted to investigate was what happens during eyewitness testimony? Eyewitness testimony is when a crime is committed and people, including children who are present at the scene of the crime, are asked to recall and narrate whatever they saw, they heard, they smelt, anything that comes to their mind because they were at the scene of the crime or they were present nearby the scene of a crime. And of course, eyewitness testimony is very persuasive when presented as evidence because you feel like somebody will be very accurate in what they remember. And a lot of narrations of eyewitness testimony or the way that people tell their stories is very compelling. It's very um, believable. Um, 
Unfortunately, eyewitness testimony can also be very, very unreliable, as you've seen earlier, where there are much higher rates of wrongful convictions when they have been drawn from eyewitness testimony, because there's been a mistaken identification of the suspect where that person is actually innocent, but has been shown through eyewitness identification or eyewitness testimony as being guilty, but they are not actually the culprit. They did not actually commit the crime. Now, why does this happen? Remember, I mentioned that memory is the product of different processes that come together for us to remember an event or a piece of information. But the thing that's important for us to also keep in mind is that memory can be contaminated. And actually, every time you retell a story, you may change some details. And the details that change is not intentional on your part, but every time you retell a story, the memory of what actually happened can degrade over time because you change little, little details. And over time, you obviously don't notice because you're not doing it intentionally. But essentially, the longer ago an event happened, there is a gap between your experience and your remembering. And every time you retell that story, that gap becomes longer and longer and longer, meaning that over time, your memory cannot be as reliable as possible. But this is one of the reasons that the police especially are very aggressive and try to reduce the time that they take to get an eyewitness identification in place or an eyewitness testimony in place. However, this is suffic not sufficient because there are also distortions in memory that occur no matter, regardless of time, which further muddle up the testimony and make it a little more inaccurate because there's something that happens which is called confabulation. Uh, if you want to simply remember what confabulation is, it's essentially when you're filling in the gaps in your memory because you don't want to sort of realize or you can't confront the fact that you don't remember fully. And you might now realize that confabulation is also part of this degradation that happens every time you retell a story. You kind of fill in the gaps, but when you're filling in the gaps in your memory, you may be relying on inaccurate details or incorrect details or things that didn't really happen. So another way to remember confabulation is, and you may be familiar with this term of false memory. Now, false memory is a very, you know, hotly debated topic. But the truth is that, yes, false memory is absolutely something that's very real. And all of us can have false memories. We usually, false memory is our way, our brain's way of creating a detailed sort of remembering of an event or some sort of situation that didn't actually happen, but we are so convinced it happened. And so false memory and confabulation are very related. And when an eyewitness is asked to recall what happened at the scene of a crime or who was present at the scene of a crime, which would then be identification, at that point, these distortions in memory do occur and we do need to understand what happens when an eyewitness is asked for their testimony. And so this was the first foundational piece that Pozzulo and her team were investigating in this particular research study. But they also wanted to understand what happens with a false positive response. Now, when we're talking about a false positive response, as I had mentioned earlier, a false positive response is essentially the same as a lower correct rejection rate. So imagine that I presented you with one, two, three, four people, and you had to choose who actually mm, who actually stole my lunch and if you had to choose who actually stole my lunch and i told you that i'm relying on you and you have to identify the thief because i'm very very hungry and you looked at this lineup and actually none of them stole my lunch but because i had told you that you must make a choice you must help me you must tell me who who the possible culprit is you went ahead and you said, oh, 
it's got to be this person right here. The culprit is not actually in this lineup, but you have chosen a person and you are definitive and sure that this is the person. This means that you are, first of all, incorrectly rejecting these people, but you're also incorrectly selecting these people. And that means you're identifying a culprit when there isn't actually one there, which is a false positive response. It is a reduced correct rejection because actually what you should have done is that you should have rejected all of these because none of these are the actual culprit. So your correct rejection is reduced as you see more and more false positive responses. Now, let's get into the types of lineups. There are two main types of lineups. One is a target present lineup. A target present lineup is when the actual culprit is really part of the lineup. So let's assume this guy here actually did steal my lunch. And if you were presented with a lineup that included him, that would be a target present lineup. However, if this guy was not in the lineup, then you would be right to say that it's a target absent lineup. And so you must remember that the difference between target present and target absent is essentially a target absent lineup does not actually have the person who is guilty of whatever the crime is that has been committed. And so when you're looking at a target present lineup, there are only three possible answers, right? You can either correctly identify the person because the person is actually present, or you can identify the wrong person who hasn't actually done the crime, which would then be a false negative, or you could identify, sorry, I mean, you could identify the wrong person, which would be a false positive, or you could reject everyone. And because the actual culprit is present by rejecting everyone, what you're doing is providing a false negative response. But when a target is absent, when the target is not actually there, the only possible responses are either you will correctly reject all of the options, right? Or you will incorrectly select one of the options. And so when you have target absent lineups, you see that there is a lower correct rejection rate, meaning that there are higher false positive identifications. People are more likely to identify a suspect who is not actually present. And this was something that Pozzulo herself in a previous research study had found.